Welcome back to Fullerton College Print 101. This is your instructor, Ben Kewitt. I'm taking off on the second part of our measurement lecture. Now let's talk about basis weight and how we specify paper. You've heard this bandied about by everybody because this is how paper is sold in the United States. We sell it as 20 pound, 80 pound, 100 pound. They have a pound weight. That's the basis weight. Did you ever wonder what exactly weighs 20 pounds and 20 pound bond? You, I mean, it's the most common paper. We all use it all the time for everything. Flyers, notebook paper, um, copies. It's always this paper. It's always 20 pounds. But what weighs 20 pounds? It can't be a single sheet. There's no way that's 20 pounds. We're not that strong. It can't be one packaged ream either because I can hold that in one hand. And let me tell you, I'm not that strong. Um, so what exactly is 20 pounds? Basis weight is one ream of the basic size. So let's scroll back out here for a second here. So the basic size, 22 by 17, if you have 500 sheets of that, that is what weighs 20 pounds. So in fact, when you're talking basis weight for 20 pound bond, that's how much four reams of paper weighs, not how much one ream of paper weighs. Hmm. And that is fine. You can measure it that way. You can weigh a ream of the basic size. The problem comes in that the basic size changes depending on the type of paper. So that 20 pound bond is not directly comparable to 20, well, 24 pound bond is still bond. It's not directly comparable to 60 pound cover. It's not directly comparable to 100 pound text. Bond, text, and cover all have their own unique basic size. As seen in the picture on the side here, we have the drawing paper and watercolor paper. Both of them come from different sizes. They're both called 80 pound in this one, but one must be thicker and heavier than the other because they're different sizes. So the drawing paper is heavier than the watercolor paper. This even gets trickier when you can have a cover stock that is thinner and lighter weight than a text stock or numbers that don't match up. For instance, you can have a 100 pound text and that's still thinner than 60 pound cover. Even though, just because you have to use the word cover to define the fact that the 60 pound is a cover. The cover sizes are the like 20 by 26 inch basic sizes. So there's all these extra variables and I may not be a scientist, but I'm a fan of science. The, in science, you never want more than one variable if you can help it. So much of scientific testing has to do with eliminating variables to know that you're testing the same thing. You don't want to try to prove something to find out that some outside factor is what made it work or not work. You want to de determine if the factor you're investigating is what's causing something to happen. Doesn't matter what type of science we're talking about. That, that's part of the method. It's reducing and eliminating variables. So if you're trying to compare paper and how thick it is, and you're talking about some extra variable, especially for all of people who aren't printers, an unknown variable, there's no way a random person off the street is going to know that you know, writing paper comes from a larger parent sheet than bond paper. So trying to compare the numbers is weird. Also, as a strange side note, and i uh, sorry, I don't have a ream here with me to videotape for you. I'll try to get you a picture at some point. Some paper has more than one name. It has aliases. If you ever look at the size of, side of a package of 24 pound bond, 24 is sold as 24 slash 60. Because if you're using it as a writing paper, which has uh, 24 by 36 inch sheets, I'm sorry, I'm getting that wrong. It's not writing paper. I'm looking at my own screen. I'm sorry. If you're using it as a text, if it's 60 pound text, then that 60 pound text is coming out at uh, 25 by 38 inches. And that weighs 60 pounds, but 11, sorry, 17 by 22 inches of the same paper weighs 24 pounds. So it has two names depending on which version of the paper you want to name it, which is really awkward and really hard to do. Also 28 and 70 is a thing and 30 pound and 80 pound are a thing. It, it, it gets really awkward when you have to do the overlapping names. Anyways, enter the metric system to save the day. In the metric system, the grams per square meter, the GSM or the G slash M to the second power or squared measures one square meter of one sheet. 
this is where the A series really shines because every single paper, no matter what its intended purpose, no matter how thick it is and what you're gonna print on it, always starts out at the same size. And because you always measure the same quantity, the GSM, the grams per square meter, is directly comparable no matter what. So if the GSM goes up, that paper is thicker and heavier. If the GSM goes down, that paper is lighter and thinner. End of story. It, it's directly comparable. We were never going to use this in the US except Xerox happened. And for digital printing and copying, the way those machines work, the way they heat up the paper to melt the plastic powdered toner onto the paper to fuse it on there, it's important that you heat up the paper the right amount. If you don't heat up paper enough in an uh, electrostatic printer, then the ink just comes right back off. Uh, my old print shop and I used to call this uh, failing the thumbnail test. If you weren't sure if the paper was going to work, if it might be too thick, you printed a sheet and then you just scratched at it. If the toner flaked back off, it failed the thumbnail test and it wasn't hot enough, you couldn't do it. And if you overheat a paper, well, we all know what happens if paper gets too hot. It's called fire. So in order to keep the toner ink sticking to the paper and also not burning the paper, they had to know, have a system of defining how thick the paper was. And since people don't always caliper these things, the best response was to use the international system, grams per square meter, because that's directly comparable. And that is why GSM is something in the United States, because we needed it for digital printing. Point thickness. Because two ways of measuring paper isn't enough, here's a third way of determining how thick paper is. Thickness in points. This is a micrometer. We used to just call it a mic at my old job. And the micrometer measures thousands of an inch or sorry, hundreds of an inch, sorry, strike that. Three, no, it's thousands. It measures thousands of an inch. 10 point paper is one, is 10 thousandths of an inch or one one hundredth of an inch. 14 paper is 0 0.014 inches thick. This is typically used for cover stock. You use these calipers, these micrometers to measure exactly how thick in the thousandth of an inch they are. The pound weight, in uh, the US measuring system only goes up, yeah, well, it goes up, but typically falls out of use right when the points thickness comes in. And points thickness and poundage kind of line up to each other at 100 pound cover, which is 10 point paper, typically. It is possible to make thicker, lower density, density paper. I, for instance, have paper that's 0.1, it's 14 points thick, but only 100 pound cover uh, in our computer lab at school. Sorry, in our print lab, I don't know why I said computer, in our print lab on campus. Uh, but that's a specialty low density thick paper meant for digital printing. Typically speaking, 10 point is equivalent of 100 pound cover. 12 point is equivalent to 120 pound. But above about 120 pounds, they stop measuring in pounds and only measure in points. So they overlap briefly, but typically it falls out of use above 100 pound and then you just measure in points. This is also nice because it's directly comparable. Point thickness is point thickness. It's a single sheet, and it's measured for how thick it actually is. Pixels are a measurement. If you miss the point of image, don't worry. They miss a lot, too. There's some debate as to whether that was on purpose. But anyways, pixels. Pixel is an abbreviation of picture element, and it's a computer measurement. A pixel is one square of color in a mosaic grid of squares of color that makes up an image. However many pixels you have is however many pixels you have. I haven't counted this, but if you want to pause the video and count how many pixels are in the Stormtrooper helmet, you're welcome to. Anyways, pixels are a computer measurement of screen resolution, of how many dots make up an image. If you want to enlarge an image that's pixel-based, there used to be a tool called a proportional scale, which was a rotating kind of like a slide rule sort of thing, a rotating two pieces of material with numbers and measurements on them. And you start with the size you want and you switch to a percentage and it'll tell you how big it needs to be in inches. And if you set it to the same size, it tells you it's 100%. This mattered because before computers, before we used Photoshop and Illustrator and InDesign to do our pre-press and our page layout, it was all done by hand. Remember, stripping, haha. -ha. Anyways, paste up as it's better called, 
um, involved actually cutting and gluing your photos and your text onto a sheet to take pictures of with a giant camera to expose plates to make your printing plates. <sighs> Anyways, if you wanted to make a picture larger or smaller using that system, you had to take a photograph of it using a camera shooting through a lens that had a fixed enlargement, kind of like shooting through a magnifying glass to make it larger or smaller. So you actually had to know the percentages that you wanted and use the correct lens settings to shoot it to make the right size picture. Nowadays, you can do it on Photoshop or in InDesign, just scale the picture up and set what you want and type in the numbers and they'll do it for you. This also involves something called the Nyquist theorem, which I don't have a slide of right now and I'm sorry, but Harry Nyquist was a scientist who worked on radio transmission and his theorem was about coming up with a mathematical formula to figure out how much extra energy power did you have to pump into a radio transmission to overcome the background noise of, well, the earth itself and other radio transmissions. Turns out the same exact math works really well for determining enlargements and reductions in printing. Anyways, I wrote it on for you. Here you go. It's the percent of the enlargement times two times the lines per inch of half tone dots is equal to the resolution necessary for an image of that size. Now, typically speaking, that could be shorthanded into you want your image to be 300 pixels per inch at the size you're going to use. Screen angles. We talked about half tones. Uh, we'll briefly go over this again right now, but much more detail later. To print our four colors of ink onto paper, we don't print them solidly. I mean, you can if it's a solid color. We print a field of dots called half tones, And these dots line up on top of each other and they kind of crowd your vision and over time and at distance, if you're far enough back, you can't make out the dots individually. Then it just overall removes the right amount of color from your image, from the light source, you're talking color theory, that to you, it looks like a color. So instead of mixing them, it's a lot like pointillism if you know your impressionist art at all. Uh, pointillist paintings do this, where you put a bunch of dots of color near each other and the viewer mixes the color with their own eyes. The artist, or in our case, the printer, doesn't do any mixing. Now these angles are all carefully calculated to give these macro circles called rosettes. So they did a lot of testing of the different lines up of the screen angles to make sure they found one that was non-disruptive to the image. Turns out you're, it's impossible to do this without getting some sort of moray or interference pattern. Whenever you line up two grids, you get an interference pattern. So they made the least interfering interference pattern. And at least these larger circles don't break the illusion of the image you're looking at as bad as other ones, like zigzags or something. So magenta, um, depending on how intense the ink is, um, that's how they chose this. So yellow can be a normal zero degree. It's not rotated or 90 degrees, because it doesn't matter. It can march in those neat lines, you don't notice it. Cyan is tilted at 15 degrees, magenta is at 75 degrees, and black at 45. That way, when they line up, they make those rosettes, they don't interfere with what you're seeing, and they also don't cause any other problems. Uh, if, if the black was set to 90, it would look very regimented and you wouldn't see the image as well. So they give that to yellow, it's hardest for us to see. We have some measuring equipment. So you can measure the density of those dots. In order to make pictures darker when we print them, we print more, well, not more. In this, which is a amplitude, AM modulated, so AM sampling, uh, we, our half tones are always the same spacing, but they get bigger or smaller. Think about a marching band going by back when they used to have bands and parades. And the band, no matter how small the 30 pound flute player is in the front, they march in the same lines in the same columns as the big guy in the back with the bass drum or the sousaphone tuba. They're always marching in the same band, but yeah, the flute and the clarinet players, they're tiny little people, typically, not always. I'm kind of doing some band stereotypes and they're in the same rows. So the rows don't change, but the dots get larger when you want thicker, heavier color. This can be measured using a densitometer. Uh, you can have a reflective one, which measures on printed paper or a pass-through one called a transmission densitometer. The transmission one's meant for testing film, although we don't do that very much anymore since we don't use film very much anymore. And lastly, I will leave you on my very favorite word that we'll talk about it more probably, the spectrophotometer. 
which actually measures the wavelengths of light being reflected off of any surface, typically a printed surface. I like these a lot because they give you a mathematical, scientific, exact measurement of what color should be visible off of a printed surface. Thank you for listening. Sorry if I rambled a bit too much about the French Revolution.